My name is David Larrabee. I'm a retired physicist, but also, a, a, I guess one of my professors said I claim to be a theologian. I have an MA in systematic theology from Union Theological Seminary. Um, <clears throat> today, I want to argue that climate change cannot be solved, but it can be managed. So for the last several years, I have been one of the instructors in a certificate program on urban sustainability. We discuss the concept of wicked problems, and this concept of wicked problems cannot be solved, but they can be managed. Our students struggle to view problems through a lens of management rather than solution. My talk has been strongly influenced by those students and a co-instructor, Nashwani Bashith, to whom I owe a debt of gratitude. So let me start the discussion um, of what is meant by wicked problems. The, data, the, the idea dates back to 1973 in a paper entitled Dilemmas in the General Theory of Planning by Ritter and Webster. Climate change is as much a social problem as a, a technical one. Any solution would have to address not only the technical aspects, but the social aspects as well. We have made progress with technical innovations. Getting agreement on social, political, and international policies remains elusive. Climate change is an example of a class of social planning problems called wicked problems. So, I'll start off by describing the essential features of wicked problems. Effectively, managing wicked problems requires building some shared vision among the stakeholders. To turn visions into reality requires change. That change is most easily accomplished when the social situation, usually a crisis, provides a unique moment, a kairos moment, when real lasting change is possible. I often get asked about hope. Hope for a solution is elusive. Hope for effective management remains less elusive. Then Romans 8 is a passage if I'm an, as an eco-theologian, I would be negligent if I didn't bring up Romans 8 as a passage where you can look at the Bible for ecological hope. And so finally, I'll summarize the results. So let's talk about wicked problems. Um, from, this is from uh, Ritter and Webster. They propose 10 characteristics of wicked problems. I'm not going to present them in their order, and I'll take some liberty with their exact words. So four of the criteria have to do with the formulation of the problem. One. There is no definitive formulation of a wicked problem. The nature of the problem depends upon whom you ask, and usually depends upon their idea of a required solution. In fact, you cannot understand the problem apart from the ideas for the solution. To definitively formulate the problem, you would need to gather together all possible solutions in order to gather all the required information. Two. Every wicked problem can be considered to be a symptom of another problem. Is the burning of fossil fuels the exclusive cause of climate change? Or is this a symptom of excessive consumption, an extractive economic system, a bad relationship with the planet, too large of a population, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Of course, all of these are interconnected problems. Three, there is no immediate and ultimate test of a solution. Without a clear definition of the problem, you really have no way of knowing if your solution is really a solution. And connected with that, there is no stopping rule. No criteria by which we can say, we're done. <laughs> Typically, we stop when we run out of funds, we grow tired of the program, or if you're a politician, perhaps we just declare victory and move on. <laughs> Many of us here were trained in a traditional pro problem-solving strategic way. We gather the required data, we develop possible solution strategies, we try a strategy, we evaluate the result. If successful, you're done. If you're not successful, try another strategy. Wicked problems don't even get past the first stage. Perhaps thinking about solutions to wicked problems is counterproductive. Much of life consists of managing problems. We manage the seven deadly sins, we manage chronic conditions, we manage relationship issues. Societal issues are rarely solved, but we attempt to manage them. Poverty, 
social justice, racism, to name a few. Theologically, between now and the second coming, we're undergoing the process of sanctification, the management of sin. Solutions are rare. Management is the norm. Creation care, as I see it, is not looking for a solution as much as it is nurturing a relationship between humans and the rest of God's creation. Consequently, creation care has no specific problem formation and has no stopping rule. Some of the issues he has are with uh, the management side. So, wicked problems are essentially unique. The key word here is essentially. Okay? You can find similarities as well as differences between any two sets of problems. In wicked problems, the differences are important enough that they overwhelm the similarities. For example, comparing the ozone hole issue with climate change, we find two significant differences. First, there was a substitute for the CFCs that were creating a hole in the ozone layer. And secondly, the solution did not involve rethinking, reinventing, and retooling the entire world economy. Every solution is is a one-shot operation. Okay. Wicked problems do not allow us to start over. <laughs> you can't say, I've solved the climate change, didn't work out, let's try another one, because every time you, you try something, you change the result. If we have a geoengineering solution is tried, you can't just untry it. Okay. So there's no opportunity to learn by trial and error. The outcome of each effort creates a new starting point. Management has to adopt to the new modified problem. Seven, the consequences of failure are grave enough that the planner, the proposer of the solution, has no right to be wrong. The United Nations, of Co the United Nations Conference of the Parties comes to mind here. Okay. Let's take a step back to the theological look. We can view the history of Israel as a series of divine adaptive management actions. From slaves in Egypt, to wandering in the wilderness, to creating a new nation in Canaan, to exile or return, each step creates new possibilities while closing off the past. Each adaptation proceeds from a Kairos moment. Perhaps we need to think of this moment in history as another example where we have traveled from one set of circumstances to another, more of a transformation than a solution, a change of path rather than a resolution. Think about Israel returning from the Babylonian exile. Although the physical location was the same, the social and cultural situation was very different. What emerged from the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 CE ultimately gave us modern Judaism. The second, the second group of them has to do with, with proposed solutions. The choice of the cause of the problem determines the proposed problem's resolution. What is the cause of climate change? If you answer fossil fuels, then the solution becomes the elimination of fossil fuels. If you see the problem is economic, you might favor a carbon tax. If you see the problem as technical, then you might prioritize carbon captures and storage, or perhaps nuclear power. If you think the problem is overconsumption, then you might prioritize reducing energy consumption. Wicked problems have multiple interaction and interdependent causes. Solutions are not true or false, but good or bad. There's an old adage that you can never do just one thing in environmental situations. Electrify automobiles in order to reduce dependence on fossil fuels, has given rise to expansion of lithium mines with environmental consequences. The placement of solar farms has implications for land use management, plus solar cell manufacture also has environmental causes. We have good or bad outcomes, or too often, bad or worse outcomes. Finally, 10A, I've bitten the two. We do not have an exhaustive set of potential solutions. There are often many different influences on the problem. 
each with their own cause. These influences are interacting in a myriad of ways. Each proposed solution may address one or a few aspects of the problem. Wicked problems are often complex enough that an exhaustive listing of all the potential approaches and solutions is impossible, at least in the time strength given. Finally, there is no well-defined set of permissible operations that may be incorporated in the plan. Different stakeholders have different ideas about the consequences of the proposed solutions and about what should be prioritized or even attempted. One group might prioritize the growth of the electric automobile industry while another opposes the operations of that mine. Carbon capture and storage is proposed by some and rejected by others. Drawing up a list of what actions are acceptable is problematic at best. If universal acceptance of the proposed solution is desired, the list of proposed operations is probably the null set. So what do we do? How do we manage this? So I'm going to start by suggesting that the first step is to develop some shared values and visions. So how do we employ these ideas of climate change? The temptation is to organize around specific proposed solutions. Okay, Problem solving starts with the issue at hand, looks to the past for guidance, and attempts to craft a solution that basically maintains the status quo. Creation care evaluates the proposed actions based on their ability to advance the present toward a shared vision. Shared visions imply some shared values. Building a community with a shared vision based on shared values is the prep work for effective adaptive management, whether you're a church, a businessman, or climate change. The congregational vision statement that many of us have been involved in can be an example of a shared vision. But to do this well is time-consuming and difficult work, requiring more than a single congregational questionnaire. Building a shared vision that includes people of many faiths is tough work indeed but it's work that has started. So how do we enter into dialogue to create shared values? Well, first of all, we need the humility to recognize that our Western civilization is largely responsible for the problem. We interpret the Bible through a Western civilization point of view that would be foreign to the authors of the Bible. A dialogue with indigenous peoples can help us read the Bible through the eyes of an early agrarian society. A dialogue with the Eastern Orthodox and Coptic churches can show us other biblical possibilities. This, di this dialogue might help us see the biblical basis for the intrinsic value of all God's creation, the interconnectedness of all things, creation's voice against injustice, a mandate to care and protect for creation, and seeing creation as one community with a God-given purpose. Shared values help create shared visions. For example, a commitment to the sacredness of life can lead to a vision of a world which minimizes heat death, malnutrition, crop failures, water shortages, homelessness, inadequate health care, and more. This is not to say that the group will necessarily agree on the causes of the problems or their solutions. What is agreed upon is the desirability of the end results. Such a results come about through dialogue. We can learn a lesson from those engaged in interreligious dialogue about how to develop such shared visions. I suggest a starting point might be Catherine Cornell's The Impossibility of Interreligious Dialogue. I have a talk a couple of years ago here about that ongoing effort. Among her recommendations for dialogue are commitment to the dialogue, interconnection with others, empathy, and hospitality. Too often what passes for dialogue is really competing monologues or outright apologetics. We need to see the world through other people's experience rather than evaluating their experience through our own traditions. So I was in an evangelical group that was reading the book Braiding Sweetgrass. It became clear that many members were reading the book through the lens of an evangelical reading of scripture. It is far more interesting book when read in a way that tries to understand the point of view and experience of the indigenous author. One can then ask what the book has to say about evangelical theology. 
The insights so gained become invaluable to seeing how our worldview permeates our understanding of Scripture. Okay. Finally, I think it's important that the visions we build are positive and not apocalyptic. We need to emphasize what is positive in the transition we are experiencing. So I want to talk a little bit about Kairos moments. The Greek word Kairos is used in the New Testament when referring to an appointed time as opposed to sort of the clock type time, or, or chronos. Kairos is not measured by a day or an hour, but by the expectation that time is ripe for something to happen. It might be a time for harvesting the crop, or a time of salvation. So, myself and others are te uh, teachers. So teachers talk about the teachable moment, as um, an event when things come together for a student when a real advance is possible, okay, a time of opportunity. So Kairos moments are these openings in time. They often have a start and an end, okay? They're, and so Merriam-Webster defines uh, Kairos moment as a time when conditions are right for the accomplishment of a crucial action, the opportunities and decisive moment. So most of our change seems to come about during a time of crisis. Kairos moments provide us with the opportunity to choose between moving forward towards a vision or solving the problem to try to maintain the status quo. Okay? Or perhaps doing as little as possible to convince people that something's happening, what I would call greenwashing. If there's a shared vision that can be brought to bear in that Kairos moment, then a movement forward rather than a defense of the status quo, becomes possible. It is this kind of Kairos moment that can have a profound effect on the future. Oftentimes, the interval in which the Kairos moment is operative is too short to build the community. So the vision stuff has to happen beforehand. So when the Kairos moment opens up, you can move. I don't think there's a single massive Kairos moment that's going to do the transition. Rather, there is likely to be a series of smaller Kairos moments. Here, a group that can take the lead in the current moment is a positive. What too often happens in my experience is that other groups favoring other causes and other solutions get in the way or try to hog the limelight. Rather than let the group that really can respond well, respond. And here's where the lens of, of, of the lens of avoiding solutions, but management helps. If you think your one solution, the solution to the problem, and somebody else has the limelight, you're going to try to step in. If you see it as a small advance, you can either help or just get out of the way. Look at I think Jordan Moulton puts it best to perceive the chances in the crisis. Okay. It is here that we can effectively advance the kingdom. I promised I'd address hope. I get this about asked hope a lot. Usually the person asking about hope is looking for some data, some experience that makes a reasonable case that we can come through the crisis in good order. Good luck. As Christians say, we put our hope in God or Jesus. We know that ultimately the world will be redeemed even when the force of evil seem to be gaining ground. We believe that in time, God will make all things right. Our job is not to complete the task, but to advance the kingdom as best we can. So the standard eco-theological eco answer to hope to the climate context is Romans 8, 19-25. So I'll read it and make some brief comments. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the cre whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, going inwardly, inwardly while we wait for the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we are saved. The hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, 
We wait for it with patience. The first verses spell out a vision of creation being set free. And then it goes on to spell out the current situation that both we and creation are groaning as a kingdom may be advancing in God's time. Kairos, not ours. The passage ends with a statement that our hope is for, is for what we do not yet see. We do not yet see what awaits us at the other end of this transition time. Perhaps we need to stop thinking about hope as a noun, something we have, but as a verb, something we are working towards. Oops. Should have advanced it. Okay. Summary. Wicked problems like climate change cannot be solved, only adaptively managed. Effective management requires a shared positive future vision of the future. That future vision needs to be shared by a diverse group of stakeholders. Kairos moments, usually in a crisis, provide the opportunity to take a step towards that future in Christian context to advance the kingdom of God. No one group can prepare for all possible Kairos moments. Something we have, to, sometimes we have to get out of the way. The alternative is to problem solve, using an effort to maintain the status quo. Creation care searches for a set of biblically based ecological values and future vision in dialogue with others. It is not looking for a solution, but of moving towards the kingdom. It is a task that has no end, at least until Christ returns. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to mention a few Cairo's moments in the elimination of slavery. Uh, the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin, mm. uh, the John Brown uh, attempt, uh, 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 his, his being hanged and being a hero of the abolitionists. Uh, 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 when uh, Lincoln uh, emancipation pro uh, the Emancipation Proclamation of Lincoln. He followed it up with a constitutional amendment. Mm -hmm. Then, a century later, we have the Voting Rights Act. Mm -hmm. and we all know that that quote from Martin Luther King mm -hmm. and he ended up giving his life for that moment. So, mm -hmm. I think we have to be, I'd like to talk about incremental progress, mm -hmm. small tires. You can see them, and we still have a way to go. Yep. We got to, they said, "There's no, there's no stopping rule." So, <laughs> yeah, that was just some examples of Kairos moments from the ending of slavery. Um, I feel like we have a lot of uh, ex examples of not positive visions. Oh yeah. I was wondering if you would share if you have any favorite examples of uh, groups or or people that are you feel like are doing a good job of casting positive visions. So, asking for examples of positive uh, visions. So, um, I'll, I'll sort of give you a, a personal example, maybe. Um, I was at a World Council of Churches, presenting a World Council of Churches meeting um, in Crete, and there the, the Eastern Orthodox Church, um, some people of a different faith, the Coptic Church, uh, we're together to try to form some ideas of what an eco-theology would look like in the vision. And actually, I was blown away by the Ethiopian Orthodox, um, who showed pictures of uh, Ethiopia. Basically, every available farm thing that could be farmed was farmed. But if there's a cluster of trees, there's a church there. Because of the strong association with nature, with the church. So, and, I mean, visions are in terms of the country, right? So here's a church that many of us are unfamiliar who is, who is planting trees out of their religious heritage as, as part of the thing. So they're casting a vision and it's occurring naturally to the community. Um, I think Mitch Hiscock and EEN, who looks at um, issues around children's health, as opposed to tackling climate hair, uh, change head on, is casting a vision of the well-being of children, okay, which provides opportunities. So I don't think it means to be this huge vision of everything that's there, 
You 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 work on something. What's the vision for that something? I, I accept. I should see the uh, characterization wicked problem for climate change. I just wonder how you how it incorporates the element of time, whether it it's irrelevant to it or whether uh, that the climate change there is a sense of clock ticking. So how would it, uh, looking at it as a wicked problem um, deal with that sense of this time? So, okay, so the question is, um, how does the wicked problem characteriz characterization for climate change incorporate the idea of time? So there's some group of authors that have, have now said that climate change is a super wicked problem for that very reason, that there's a time limit. And the short answer to you is, to put it another way, 1.5 degrees C is dead. I mean, even the IPCC is saying, well, let's just suck the carbon out of the air so it'll be 1.5 degrees C at the end of the century. Okay. So, you're bound by what, what can happen in the social context, okay? And so, there's no stopping rule. So, when we get to 2 degrees C, we're still at it. But you, uh, one, of the, one of the students we had in this program, uh, I kept having to, having to remind them that having an atlas concept where you, the entire problem of everything is on your back all the time, is not healthy and not productive. <laughs> and I said, there's 7 billion people on the planet. There's maybe 1 billion of us that are really responsible for the problems. So you accept 1 billionth of the solution. <laughs> and if you do 1 billionth of the work, you've done your fair share. If you do 2 billion, that's even better. <laughs> but you don't have to do all of it. So I hope that helps. <laughs> you know, I, I was tracking and I understand the difference between trying to solve problems as compared to manage them. Where I kind of stumbled is when you used as an analogy, we manage sin. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, late theologian Dallas Willard said that's the worst uh, <laughs> understanding of discipleship, right? That discipleship is something uh, positive, it's the, it's the being conditioned in love and in Christ's likeness stuff, whatever. <laughs> so what I'm wondering is if there's maybe something additional, is there another thing we can do to problems besides just solving, managing, what else might be out there? Okay, so the question is um, about the analogy of managing sin, and is there another alternative beyond solving and managing? So, yes and no. Um, for the sake of the argument, let's say that I take a piece of the pie. Uh, I'm dealing with transportation. So I decide that our group is trying to, to further the use of electric automobiles. Okay, and that's a solution to a piece of the problem. Okay, but that solution has consequences. And I'm not going to always know what those consequences are when I do the solution. It's going to change the solution. So I can do a sort of another, this is what I mean by adaptive management. So I might later on have to change a strategy or do something else because I'm in a new situation. I now have a bunch of cars running around with lithium batteries that we may have recycling issues. Who knows? Um, so in, in, if there are engineers here, there's a, there's a principle called uh, that if I try to sub-optimize each piece of the system, that does not yield an optimum for the system. And so solving this piece and this piece and this piece doesn't necessarily solve the problem. But it's all you can do. You're not going to solve the big problem in one thing. So I would just say the same thing in terms of, 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 of sin. It's so yeah, I take your point that it's more than just managing our sin. But we don't ignore the sin either. Nor do we expose it to magically go away, <laughs> you know. Well, it will eventually, right? But, that, that's, but not here and now in this life. So you have to deal with your sin. So call it what you have will. It's prayerful, it's not, but it's still. I hope I've answered your question. <laughs> we better move on. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you.